și... He was called Shah and Shah, King of Kings, and for better or worse, the Shah of Iran transformed his country into a 20th century power. Until revulsion against his regime, combined with the resurgence of ancient religion, brought revolution to Iran. Among the victims, Americans stationed in Iran. The death of the Shah and the Iranian hostage crisis in this edition of the 20th century. I'm Mike Wallace. This is the story of the rise and fall of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the Shah of Iran, the man who would be king. This king business is nothing but headaches. But I think that by the grace of God, we are going to succeed because we have the goodwill of even more than 99% of our own people. And I suppose the goodwill of the whole world. The Shah linked his destiny to the power of the United States. He thought that alliance would give him the legitimacy he sought. But in the end, it brought him down. Reza Pahlavi's dream was to re-establish the ancient grandeur of 2,000 years of the Persian Empire. He saw himself as the reincarnation of the great heroes of Persia, remembered in these ruins, now a shrine to ancient glory. But when oil was discovered in 1908, Iran, in its 25th century, saw a future to rival its past. But Reza Pahlavi's lineage didn't go back 2,500 years. The Shah was the son of a peasant. The Pahlavi dynasty was spawned by his father, an army sergeant who engineered a coup in 1921 to overthrow the monarchy. During World War II, the elder Pahlavi, blatantly pro-Nazi, was forced by the Allies to abdicate the throne. And his 21-year-old son, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, was installed as the new Shah. But in the 1950s, a populist prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, forced the Shah from power. The CIA staged counter demonstrations. The Shah was put back on his throne, and Mossadegh went to jail. Though the Shah commuted his sentence, the former prime minister spent the rest of his life in political exile. With the Shah back in power, President Eisenhower promptly came forward with military and economic aid to Iran, and a partnership was born. Our relations have always been more than friendly. We are really, at heart, allies. We cannot ask really for better relations. Later, it was President Kennedy playing host to the Shah, and not only the White House, the Congress too embraced him as a valued ally. Then imagine, what a strong fortress of liberty Iran will be if she retains her alliance with the West and is able to raise her standard of living up to a level comparable with that of the progressive nations of Europe. The Shah saw himself as the charismatic leader of a modern Iran. He made promises of hope, the hope of homes, food, and education for the Iranian masses. And there was the land. The Shah tried to eradicate feudalism. He distributed part of his own land in full dress ceremonies with the Shah in the central role of benevolent despot. But oil brought more than just social reform. The Shah built the best army money could buy with the best equipment the United States could sell to him. America's strategic interest in having military bases near the Soviet Union fit in with the Shah's oldest dream to dominate the Persian Gulf. If we are weak, it's like an invitation to the waltz. But the Shah didn't want his country to waltz anymore. He wanted Iran to be strong and prosperous, modern. He remade Tehran, its ancient capital, into an up-to-date international city. The Shah married three times, but the woman who may have had the greatest influence was his twin sister, Princess Ashraf. 
she encouraged her brother to bring Iranian women out from behind their veils. Your Majesty, why do you think it's important that the women of Iran have the vote? We think that those women at home with this new responsibility will educate their children much better than before, try to inculcate into their own children that spirit of citizenship and responsibility towards society. The United States began to look to the Shah as a voice of enlightenment in the Middle East. But Iran was a long way from Western-style democracy. And like his changing kingdom, the Shah himself was a study in contrasts. On the surface, a dedicated sovereign. In reality, a dictator with a love of grandeur, sustained by corruption, but always promising democracy. I had uh, said on some previous occasions that we needed 10 years here. Uh, to try to make uh, this country a kind of a model state, a country where absolute justice will prevail, not only in the courts, but social justice too. Iran was a dubious democracy, with the Shah as king, the grantor of all rights, with all the power, with special privileges for his friends. They say you can't get a contract here, and everybody's here. You know that, vendors, contractors, without a little of, uh, true? I think it's the most unjust thing that is said. It's just jealousy. For instance, the military purchases, it's government to government. If there is a corruption, it's from your government or the government of every other country from which we buy. So this is the unfairest and most unjust thing that I have heard. Is it possible, Your Majesty, that because you are so busy and because you have so many things occupying you that it could be going on behind your back, sir? No. It's impossible because I have at least five uh, inspectorate organizations. One, sooner or later, they will be caught. And, let me say this, First of all, I think this is a cheap accusation. Second, it is less than anything that you have in your so-called permissive society. You mean you think there is more corruption in the United States than uh, in... Well, especially in your country, yes. Yet the rumors on the streets of Tehran had it that large portions of Iran's petrodollars were going directly to its ruling elite, the royal family, the Shah's cronies even to the Shah himself. It was also rumored that the Shah paid off the mullahs, the powerful Muslim clerics, presumably to encourage the loyalty of the faithful. Another rumor, that money was laundered through a network of international banks the Shah controlled under his Pahlavi Foundation. All this led to increased disaffection among students and the left wing. Violence in Iran has escalated sharply in recent months. The Shah has declared his intention to relax censorship, legalize demonstrations, and open up parliamentary elections. But members of Iran's moderate opposition view the Shah's reforms as mere cosmetics, as an attempt to provide a safe outlet for growing discontent while keeping all effective power in his hands. The Shah's most powerful, most feared weapon against the growing opposition was Savak, his dreaded secret police force. Known for torture and ruthless brutality, Savak's atrocities had been documented by Western investigators. 37-year-old Sia Zand has fled Iran, coming to London to seek political asylum in Britain. For the last six years, Zand served as deputy press aide to the Shah of Iran. He says it was common knowledge in Tehran government circles that the Shah regularly ordered or approved the arrest, torture, and even the killing of political dissidents while turning a blind eye to widespread royal family and government corruption. You're saying you do what every country does. Sure. If why torture not? is necessary, you torture. Not the torture in the old sense of torturing people, twisting their arms and doing this and that. But there are intelligent way, ways of uh, questioning now. Well, they talk about psychological and physical torture. Physical, I don't believe. I talked... Not anymore. Maybe in the old days. Maybe. I talked just today to a man whom I believe 
who told about torture. He was tortured? Yes. And you believe that he was tortured? Yes. How many years ago? Within, I want to be very careful, not yesterday. Ah, well, maybe. I don't know. The word has gone out to stop it. To stop what? Torture. But a long time ago, yes. But the victims of Savak knew better. They would tie the hands and feet, and there would be some sort of a hood that would be placed uh, on their head, uh, such that whenever they would scream, it would echo uh, in their head. And then they, they would whip you at the bottom of your, the sole of your feet with the electrical cords. The Shah remained impervious to the rising clamor of protest from his own people. To him, it was all a question of leadership, firm leadership, his leadership. What you're saying, Your Majesty, is that Father knows best. What if you get a leader here who does not have your wisdom, your compassion? Then, the Tell relationship me. between that leader and his people will not be the one existing between me and my people. He will become another leader, as we had many in our country, who was kicked out by... Well, my father kicked uh, the former king here because he had no contact with his people. And, of course, there are some dissidents, very small in number here, who would like to kick you out. Uh, Twelve of them are in, uh, are in jail, and a couple of them, or three of them, are going to be put to death. And six more will be sh shot but because they are betraying their country, not because they're against me. And they're betraying their country by? Being Marxists and uh, owing their allegiance to not their country. You're a firm man, sir. It's still needed. I can forgive those who try to kill me and even abduct my wife and my child but not those who betray the country. During the early 70s, Iran's oil revenues swelled, as did the Shah's self-esteem. In 1973, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi and his oil-producing partners quadrupled the price of oil. He justified the price rise as an act of moral leadership. Candidly, Your Majesty, is there no element, not of, uh, not of revenge, because that is not a noble impulse, but at least some element of satisfaction in seeing the giants of the West in some disarray? Well, no, because their disarray is, uh, I think, needs a restructure of their society. The brown-eyed peoples are teaching the blue-eyed peoples something, is that? Well, no, we really, we are not teaching something. The blue-eyed people have to wake up. Wake up to? From their complacency to, for this torpor in which they put themselves by taking maybe too many sleeping pills. But the Shah, too, was complacent, secure in his absolute power and vast wealth. He resisted pressure to modify his repressive regime. But by early 1978, rising discontent was fast heading toward revolution. Leading the opposition, the Ayatollah Khomeini and his Shiite Muslim clergy. They spoke for the common people of Iran, and they did in fact command their loyalty, even as the Shah was losing it. Though the Shah has stripped the Muslim chieftains of their large land holdings, they remain powerful with many followers and have opposed the modernization of Iran on grounds that the Shah is leading the country away from its Islamic traditions. Fundamentalism took hold with a fury and a force that helped ignite the still impoverished masses in Iran who felt they had little reason to be grateful to the Shah. The fabulous profits from oil had not filtered down to them. Autumn 1978, anti-Shah demonstrations had grown to such proportions that the Shah declared martial law in most of Iran's cities. 
In a cemetery near Tehran, another casualty of the country's civil unrest is being buried. The victim, a 16-year-old girl, shot by army soldiers while taking part in an anti-government demonstration. Authorities warned long ago such activity was forbidden and would be put down mercilessly, and so far they have kept their word. The crowd shouted death to the Shah. Among the despised symbols of their monarch, the marchers raised pictures of the Shah's antagonist, the bearded, fierce-eyed holy man, Ayatollah Khomeini. The preoccupation in Tehran still seems to be over whether the Shah would leave Iran once a new civilian government is formed. From his exile in France, Khomeini was the chief fomenter, the mastermind, and eventually the inheritor of Iran's Islamic revolution. The Shah secluded himself in his palace, surrounded only by friends, courtiers, and officers. Hello. Hello. Happy New Year. The Empress took charge, shepherding the photographers outside for pictures. In undergoing this obviously painful meeting with the news media, the Shah seemed to be saying, here I am at my palace, and here I will stay. I fully expect the Shah to maintain power in Iran, and for the present problems in Iran to be resolved. The Shah has our support and he also has our confidence. On the advice of the United States, he ordered his troops to avoid confrontation. It was advice the Shah would soon regret. By January of 1979, it was clear the Shah could no longer reign. A tearful Shah of Iran left his country today on a vacation from which he may never return. President and Mrs. Sadat greeted the royal couple as the presidential guard played national anthem. And for the first time since violent anti-Shah protests began in Iran more than a year ago, there were celebrations in the streets of Tehran. The Shah's departure made Ayatollah Khomeini, in effect, the new ruler of Iran. The scene was euphoric as Ayatollah Khomeini emerged from his house. Chaotic, too, as several hundred people descended on the area after learning that the 78-year-old Muslim leader would return to Iran Friday after a 15-year exile. In a speech lasting about 45 minutes, Khomeini congratulated his followers and pleaded for unity. We have kicked out the Shah, he said, but the revolution is not over. There was a triumphant and tumultuous welcome in Tehran today by more than a million Iranians for the Ayatollah Khomeini, returning home from 15 years of exile. He demanded that the government resign at once or face arrest, and that foreigners, especially Americans, get out. For security reasons, the airport had been sealed off to the general public, and Khomeini's first few moments on Iranian soil were subdued. It was the quiet before the storm. Motorcade crowds were the most emotional near the University of Tehran, where scores of pro Khomeini demonstrators had been wounded or killed by Iranian troops in the past week. It was here that Khomeini's security conscious aides had to fight their way through a mass of devotion. Each step of the way, Khomeini left behind screaming admirers who tried to run after the entourage or leap aboard the official buses. Others stayed behind and held spontaneous street celebrations. Greetings to you, Khomeini, they chanted, surging toward him, desperate to touch the hand or robe of the holy man, or to have something, anything, touched and blessed by him. To touch him, one man said, is to touch the person who speaks to God. A new and more turbulent era for Iran had begun. The reign of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the man who ruled Iran through four decades, came to an end. Condemned to a life of exile, the Shah had just one more scene to play on the world stage, his own passing. His death from cancer did not come quickly, and during the months that he lingered, a man without a country, 
The militants in Iran, in their fervor, steered Iran on a collision course with the United States. The friendship that the Shah had nurtured so carefully ended abruptly when disciples of the Ayatollah Khomeini overran the American embassy and held everyone inside as hostages. On the morning of November 4th, 1979, a mob of Iranians stormed over the walls and into the gates of the American embassy in downtown Tehran. They're holding hostages, one report says as many as a hundred, most of them American, and are demanding that the exiled Shah of Iran, now undergoing cancer treatment at a New York hospital, be returned to stand trial. It was a mass kidnapping, and thus began the most traumatic diplomatic incident in American history. Iranian television released film of the student takeover. The students scaled the walls quickly, opened a gate and poured into the compound. None of the students appeared to be armed during the takeover, but a few carried sticks. The embassy staff apparently took refuge in the chancery building. They were rounded up, some were blindfolded, and led to a large room where they still wait. The Iranian militants issued an ultimatum. Return the Shah, or we will kill the American hostages. The United States refused. In the United States that fall, presidential candidates were gearing up for the first wave of primary elections. Domestic issues were suddenly pushed into the background. The fate of the hostages became issue number one. And on the top of the great Christmas tree is a star of hope. We will turn on the other lights on the tree when the American hostages come home. At early morning mass, the Lopez family heard a prayer for the safe return of Jimmy Lopez and the others. This Christmas morning, Marcia offered her own special prayer. possibility that uh, one of the hostages could be tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death. Well, I hope we don't arrive to that extent, that is, uh, the death penalty executed. But uh, I believe it's extremely premature at this time. Are you saying that a death sentence is a possible judgment? Anything is possible. All of Iran seemed united by one bitter sentiment, a seething anti-Americanism. One full month has passed like this, and according to independent observers, more than four and a half million people have turned out here since then to see it for themselves. But there is still no sign that the resolve of those holding 50 American hostages is about to weaken. The militants warned the hostages would be tried immediately if the Shah, then in New York, was not returned to Iran. Again, the United States refused. We're not going to put a man into a rowboat and send him out beyond the continental shelf if he has no place to go. We have said that we are trying to assist him in finding a permanent location. The point is we have people there and we want them home. That's all there is. Then a warning of what might happen to the Shah if he went back to Iran. His nephew was shot dead on a Paris street. In Iran, a revolutionary judge said he gave the orders. The same judge had ordered guerrillas to kill the Shah and his family earlier in the year. For Khomeini and his followers, the Shah himself was always the focus of their wrath. We want him back to show the extent of the crimes committed by this person during 37 years of his rule. We have to know the extent of his treasons in this country. This is why that uh, he has to return and he has to be tried. And then the courts will decide. But that is not him. an answer to whether the hostages but, uh, will be freed. I just gave an answer. The people will it, and we can't go against this will. Imam President Sadat of Egypt, a devoutly religious man, a Muslim, 
says that what you are doing now is, quote, a disgrace to Islam. And he calls you, Imam, forgive me, his words, not mine, a lunatic. I know that you have heard that comment. That's, yes, that's, that's what I heard President Sadat say on American television, that the Imam is a disgrace to Islam, and he used the word a lunatic. هست امام آقای سادات رئیس جمهور مصر که یک مرد بسیار مذهبی و یک مسلمان هستش گفتن که با عرض مذرد از جسارت که گفته ایشون نیست سادات ادعای اسلام می کند سادات ستیت هی از اسلام و وی آر نات هی از نات for he compromises with the enemies of Islam. Suddenly, several weeks after the hostages were taken, came the first good news for the U.S. Early this afternoon, a break, a message from Ayatollah Khomeini that all black and women hostages who are not spies were to be freed. The pressure is now on Washington to make the right move. By freeing some of the hostages, Khomeini's message to the U.S. government is clear. We have done our part. Now give us the Shah. So 13 were freed, and the homecoming for them raised the hope of freedom for all, until a new wave of protests began in Tehran. Ayatollah Khomeini had urged Iranians to march in protest to the American embassy. It turned out to be the biggest anti-American demonstration to date. Perhaps half a million people surged through the streets of Tehran. The usual slogan, death to America, death to Carter, God is great. It was another demonstration of Khomeini's immense popularity and the depth of public hatred for the Shah and all he stands for, including his American protector. Responding to the warnings from Washington, the students holding the hostages issued a warning that if they felt the threat of American military action was serious, they would kill all the hostages and blow up the embassy. He added that the lives of every American in Iran would be in danger. Press Secretary Jody Powell was questioned today about those threats in Iran to kill American hostages, and he gave a stern warning to the government of Iran not to allow that, coupled with a strong hint that if any of those hostages are harmed, the United States may retaliate with military force. In the meantime, the Shah had become a man without a country, or even a guaranteed sanctuary. At first, he had gone to Egypt to visit his old friend, President Anwar Sadat. From there, he wandered, first to Morocco, then the Bahamas, then to Mexico. And from there, he was rushed back to New York for an emergency cancer operation. His next stop was Panama, but his stay was brief. The Shah is said to have made the final decision to leave after talking with his longtime friend, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. The U.S. opposed the move because the Carter administration feared that the Shah's return to the Mideast would inflame the Iranian hostage situation, along with other Middle East hotspots. The U.S. has denied a direct involvement in the Shah's travel plans, but when the decision was made, the Shah was able to quickly charter an Evergreen International DC-8 jet. Evergreen International is a former CIA operation. And that's the way it is. Monday, March 24th, 1980, the 142nd day of captivity for the 50 Americans in Iran. And then finally he returned to Egypt, where Sadat welcomed him in a gesture of mercy to an old friend who was now close to death. Can you stay here permanently, sir? Yes! <laughs> But in providing the Shah with a place of refuge, it turned out, Anwar Sadat was putting his own life in jeopardy. The Egyptian people do not back Sadat. I demand that Egyptian people try to overthrow him just as we did with the Shah. For these past 156 days, Mr. Carter and his advisors have grasped at just about any diplomatic straw that might produce an end to this protracted problem. The United States of America is breaking diplomatic relations with the government of Iran. Early this morning, another setback. 
Ayatollah Khomeini rejected the governing Revolutionary Council's vote to transfer custody of the hostages to the government. As a Carter aid said, there's a limit and this is it. It must be made clear that the failure to release the hostages will involve increasingly heavy costs to Iran and to its interests. Some people uh, might suggest military action. Would, would you favor that with your husband over there? How can I favor it? I don't see how it could get them out. No, I'm fine. All I need is a ticket. <laughs> Three American ministers were allowed to visit the hostages for several hours on Sunday for Easter services. In the blood of Jesus, your son that we have received, give us new life. Uh, do you see any movie from time to time? Yes. yes. Nice. Is, nice. And is, uh, it's, 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 do you listen to some music? Uh, so, sometimes. Nice. Nice. The film gives the impression of a group of people in relaxed, more or less unpressured custody socializing with visitors from their own country. But once or twice, the sense of urgency about freedom slips through. No, that our prayers are with you, will you? Please. We need more than prayers, we need action. Yes. <laughs> and that's the way it is. Tuesday, April 8th, 1980, the 157th day of captivity for those Americans in Iran. Under increasing pressure to resolve the hostage crisis, President Carter ordered the carriers Kitty Hawk and Midway to the Persian Gulf, a clear signal that the United States was prepared to use military force if all diplomatic efforts failed. We interrupt this program to bring you the following special report on Iran. Reporting from New York, here is Bob Schieffer. Good morning. There was an attempt to rescue the American hostages in Iran overnight, but it failed and eight Americans in the rescue force were killed. April 24th, 1980. President Carter authorized a commando raid to rescue the hostages. It failed. Late yesterday, I canceled a carefully planned operation which was underway in Iran to position our rescue team for a later withdrawal of American hostages. The eight Americans were killed when two planes collided on an airfield in the Iranian desert near the town of Tabas, several hundred miles southeast of Tehran. Just before that, according to Tehran Radio, two American helicopters filled with what Tehran Radio described as CIA agents and U.S. Marines became stuck in the mud at the remote site. Secretary of State Cyrus Vance, who had opposed military action, resigned in protest, leaving President Carter to shoulder the blame. It was my decision to attempt the rescue operation. It was my decision to cancel it when problems developed in the placement of our rescue team for a future rescue operation. The responsibility is fully my own. At the American Embassy compound, there was no sign of a change for the hostages. It is considered doubtful that they know of the aborted attempt to set them free. But their captors issued a communique warning that if America continues with such deeds, they will find the bodies of the hostages buried with those who were the agents of such actions. One of the hostages, Elizabeth Ann Swift, later recalled the constant death threats. I could hear the uh, Iranian girls talking constantly they would come up behind me when I was tied in the chair especially at night and talk about you know that they were going to have executions and that they would be executing you know various people and one point somebody came up behind me and said I am with the execution group I thought it was a very real threat and I heard broadcasts saying that Khomeini had had released people and that there would be trials and executions and while I might not have believed the students I believed the broadcast Good evening. On the 250th day of captivity for the Americans in Iran, one of the 53 hostages, Richard Queen, is reportedly going to be freed. Radio Tehran said Queen was ordered sent home to his parents by Ayatollah Khomeini after falling seriously ill and being hospitalized. I hope it'll be an opening uh, leading to the release of the other 52, uh, because as you know, it's it's... It's an ordeal for them, and it's also a terrible ordeal for the families here. And at the height of the crisis, the man at its center, the Shah of Iran,
came to the end of his lonely exile. Today, death came to the Shah, not through the vengeance of his subjects, but as it does to ordinary men. At the age of 60, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the Shah of Iran, died of cancer. I'm very sad. For me, the Shah was a friend, a Muslim brother, and a man who stood with Egypt and with me in our difficult moments. Then, late that summer, as the now familiar protests continued on the streets of Tehran, Washington received the first signal that the leaders in Iran were looking for a way out of the crisis. On September 12, 1980, Khomeini hinted at a framework for negotiations for the hostages' release. In the message, Khomeini said the hostages, now in their 314th day of captivity, could be released if the United States meets four conditions. They are the return of all the late Shaw's property, the cancellation of all American financial claims, a promise not to interfere in Iran's affairs, and the unfreezing of Iranian assets in this country. But Iran's bargaining position weakened when suddenly they found themselves at war with their neighbor and longtime rival. Iraq today marked the start of the fourth week of the war with Iran by sending its bombers against a major refinery and the airport at Isfahan. Iran softened its stand, informing Washington that if negotiations were quickly carried out, the hostages could be home by election day, November 4th, 1980 one year to the day from the time they were taken into captivity. Meanwhile, Iran's war with Iraq ground on. The Iraqi advance along the Iranian side of the Shat al-Arab is not the quick, decisive thrust Baghdad had hoped for. At Khomeini, as elsewhere, the Iranians are putting up stiff resistance. The Iranians desperately needed military equipment, and as reluctant as they were to deal with the great Satan, nonetheless, they wanted to exchange arms for hostages which President Carter refused to do. In early October, President Carter and his Republican opponent Ronald Reagan were apparently locked in a close race. Campaigning in New York today, President Carter said he can't predict whether the hostages will be released by election day. And asked whether continued captivity might affect the voting, he said, I think the American people will understand the situation we are in and feel we are doing all we can. And that's the way it is. Thursday, October 30th, 1980, the 362nd day of captivity for the American hostages in Iraq. In their anxiety, the Republicans feared the Democrats were making a deal to bring the hostages home before the election. The dramatic end of the hostage crisis, the Republicans feared, might work to re-elect Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Known in political folklore as the October Surprise, the scenario called for Iran to free the hostages in return for military equipment from the Carter administration to use in the war against Iraq. But no deal was made. Good evening. Ronald Reagan rode an electoral vote landslide to the White House. Reagan has a huge electoral vote, 468 to 50 for Carter. That's all but two states counted. For years after the election, Democrats claimed that the Republicans, led by Reagan campaign manager William Casey and vice presidential candidate George Bush, had met with Khomeini's representatives in Paris with the goal of delaying the release of the hostages until after the election in return for arms to be delivered to Iran via Israel after a Reagan victory. No proof of that Paris meeting has ever been forthcoming, but the fact is the hostages did remain in captivity throughout the campaign. A bittersweet footnote to the holiday season. The Christmas services were performed by the papal nuncio to Iran and by three Iranian clergymen. All were blindfolded before they were taken to the hostages. The clergyman said later the hostages seemed healthy, but added their morale was somewhat weaker than last year. Becky, John Lord, Emma Lou Mark. Can you all sing with me? Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay. Catherine Koo, hostage. Tonight, her Christmas message. Love me, I pray. 
And so the hostages in Tehran and their families in the United States spent their second Christmas apart. It is now Saturday morning in Tehran and Algiers, almost Saturday in Washington, beyond the deadlines originally set by Iran and the United States for conclusion of an agreement to free the hostages. You may recall that President Carter late last month told the Iranians that they either reached agreement with him by January 16th, today, or they would have to wait and negotiate with the new Reagan administration. I'm quite sure that any agreement would be one that, uh, yes, I could carry out. On the other hand, I don't think anyone should be asked to, to sign a black check. Very wound up, very nervous, very frightened, uh, but certainly excited. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will... Inauguration Day, 1981, and the long-awaited Day of Freedom finally arrives. President of the United States. Tony Alloway in Tehran, if you're still hearing us, when the hostages left, what did you see? I could see two uh, jets, and I thought they were the Algerian 727 jets, uh, parked at the western end of the runway. And then, at about uh, 10 minutes to uh, 9 o'clock, uh, we began to see a flurry of activity, flashing of lights, all the cars withdrawing and moving back. And then uh, the small executive jet began taxiing down the runway. The hostages are free, and a long American ordeal is at an end. Those were the last sounds the hostages heard in Iran. Magba America, death to America. Apparently at this point, some of them still didn't know for sure where they were going. But it seems clear the two women hostages did. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Some 30 minutes ago, the planes bearing our prisoners left Iranian airspace and are now free of Iran. Right on, man. That's great. That's great. President Carter, we are told, spent almost a sleepless night supervising the arrangements of the last-minute transfer of the funds. The Iranians today uh, went to all the trouble of delaying the release of the hostages until after President Carter had left office. A final dig at the president who uh, they disliked the most, apparently, uh, makes one wonder just what all these delays were about. That's the way it is, Tuesday, January 20th, 1981, a day that began as the 444th day of captivity and ended as the first day of freedom for the American hostages in Iraq. A few days later, the entire nation greeted them with a hero's welcome. The afternoon of celebration in the nation's capital continues as the motorcade with the freed hostages and their families makes its way uh, slowly, patiently, down Pennsylvania Avenue. After 444 days of captivity, the American hostages were finally home. The hostage crisis left an enduring rift in relations between the United States and Iran. From Tehran, the violent forces of Islamic fundamentalism soon spread to other Muslim countries, and one of its victims was the man who sheltered the Shah in his final days. In 1982, a year after the hostages were freed, Anwar Sadat was assassinated. And in 1983, 241 U.S. Marines died in Beirut, victims of a suicide bombing that bore the signature of the Islamic Jihad, supported by Iran. Then Westerners, several of them Americans in Lebanon, were taken hostage. No one doubted Iran had devised that undertaking. To try to secure their release, Washington made secret overtures to Iran, which led to the Iran-Contra scandal. Nor was that all. Thanks in large part to U.S. aid to Iraq during its war with Iran, 
Saddam Hussein emerged as the new strongman in the region, strong enough to challenge the United States in the Persian Gulf War. All of that was set in motion when the Shah was deposed and the Ayatollah Khomeini took over. I'm Mike Wallace, and this is the 20th century.